and I think we're in, we're, we're so caught up in the society of convenience and I'm, I'm just, it happens and we've evolved into it. And somehow we've got to break ourselves out of it. Somehow we've got to bring ourselves to the table. We're to the family table. We, we've got to cook. We've, we've got to, um, maybe instead of buying that part and piece of that you know, chicken breast, you cook the whole chicken. And I tell you the way, way in, I'm actually writing a book on this subject right now and the way that we've done it in our family and it, I think can be replicated for lower income families out there where you'll take the, you know, instead of uh, portion sizes or another one too, you know, and I can go off on any number of tangents, but the way to really tackle this, you look at that one whole chicken versus the part and piece of the chicken. Part and pieces are very expensive. Buy the whole bird, if it's a good bird, raise responsibly, blah, blah, blah. It's gonna cost more. It's gonna cost at least twice as much as the chicken, probably more like three times as much. You take that bird and I can, I can at least get two or three meals for a family of four out of one bird. <laughs> I know it sounds crazy, but I'll roast the chicken. Then we'll have roast chicken. We're slicing it, carving everything off that bird. Then that ro roasted carcass I'm using, we're going to cook, and that's going to be this beautiful chicken soup. You can take the fat off of it the next day and make your matzo balls out of that, and you've got, like, the perfect matzo ball soup. Or I'm just throwing these little examples out there. And so if, if we don't get back to some of the basics that really kept our families together, you talk about the family table, what happened at the family table, more just nutrition. It was, you know, we were one watching mother or grandmother, a lot of times mothers had to work, the grandmothers were doing some of the cooking. Families stayed together. They communicated around that table. There were so many lessons to be learned. Faith was passed at that table, not, not through the preacher on, Sunday, but the faith was learned at that dinner table. And so many things we've lost because we've lost that focal point of the family and of that table. Who else is passing us? So now we're being, you know, for the past couple of generations, we're being fed this malarkey from um, smooth advertisements and this and that. We're cheaper, cheaper, cheaper. We're paying the prices. We pay the price for that cheaper chicken through the farm subsidies that are being given to these huge corporations, which um, they're the ones that, that actually regulate themselves because their regulators are the ones in the FDA and the USDA that are coming up with some of these crazy regulations, deciding what's good and what's bad, providing the standards for us today. And so you can look at all of this stuff, and I think it really comes down to it's not cheaper. It only appears to be cheaper on the outside. We're paying for it one way or the other in that if we don't recalculate the way we think about what we put into our bodies and what we're feeding to our children, then we're going to pay an even higher price for that chicken. Um, so for the single mother who works two jobs and has two or three kids, is it just education that's going to change that? I think, I think a lot of it is education. Mm -hmm. And I think that right now that poor mother is being sold a bill of goods that's, you know, unfortunately, she's gonna have a hard time breaking out of that cycle. And there's a lot of people that just have fallen into it and no fault of their own, but I think education is really gonna be the key here. Mm -hmm. You know what, and it's sort of more than the mom who's just being fed a bill of goods. Because so many of these foods that we find ourselves sort of battling against, the whole fast food thing, contain substances that, and this is something to research, that are addictive. You know, so now it's very worthwhile to look at, is, is high fructose corn syrup addictive? Is the MSG that's in the food that your child eating addictive? So the day you decide, you know, we're gonna stop this and do it right, you have howling, screaming, protesting kids who said, you know, I have this expectation that, you know, every time I put food in my mouth, there are other substances that are going to appeal to, you know, things. So, so, so education is a huge part of it and realizing how, you know, in so many ways, um, a certain kind of manipulation is taking place and then deciding no more. These are my children. How shall I live? Just to add one quick thing to that and similar to what John had mentioned earlier, or has been mentioned several times, uh, 
as we were growing up, and I know things are different nowadays and it's very fast, but my parents both worked also, but um, it was, again, it was a sense of community. And John had mentioned earlier about canning when the season was good because we had a little farm across the street and I lived in a neighborhood in a small town, but we canned things. And in the winter, you went down and got a jar of corn or a jar of tomatoes. And there was a sense of community in the fact that we had a small meat packer outside of town. Um, you would go out and say, okay, we're the family or the neighborhood would get together and say, we're going to buy a half a cow. And you would say, I want a half a cow, grass-fed. It, it was all grass-fed back then. And you told them, okay, break it down, and you get this, you get this, you get this. And again, it was that educational part of it that we've, we've lost a lot of that stuff. Like John was mentioning, you can walk into Whole Foods and say, I want an airline, and, and pay 5 $6 a pound for it. Or you can go to your neighborhood Rouse and buy a whole chicken and go home and uh, make an event out of it instead. So... Thank you. We have about five more minutes, so we're going to try to squeeze in these two questions. This lady over here has been waiting patiently. Um, so in a generation where very few of us have had parents who cook all the time, where we sit down to dinners together, and then where we cook ourselves, do you think that in today's society that cooking has become more intimidating to people of our age and even some of our parents? Is that why it's no longer, like, that's why we don't approach it so often? Well, I think nobody has to cook. And it, now it's just a lot more convenient because, you know, it is cheaper in a sense to just go to the, do it right through the drive through and I've got something, a buck 99, Johnny's got a little happy meal and everybody's good. And it t saves time and blah, 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 blah. And I think it, we've just gotten so far away from it. I think we've, there was a, Michael Pollan actually wrote a great piece in the New York Times, uh, heck, it's been almost a year ago, about us and cooking and actually food TV and that we watch it, we salivate over it, but I'll, we don't want to actually get in there and do it. And that there are um, a couple of doctors that have taken on the, the, the that are, the proposes theory that in essence, if we were, you know, we're, we're starting to, you know, as a society, we have different medical issues because of what we're eating and how we eat and blah, 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 blah. If we were to actually cook everything it is that we put into our body, you could eat just about anything you wanted and maintain a good semblance of health and relatively so and not gain weight because of the, just the actions of going through producing or uh, transforming or manipulating the food uh, to cook for us and that the evolution of man is really going to take a down, downward spiral because we're actually not cooking it any longer and um, it was the cooking that um, that really sparked something in our evolution to, so that we could take in nutrients much easier and now things are really so polluted and clouded because we've gotten so far away from that. I know you're itching to say something. Yeah. So. We have a weekend cafe. We have a weekend cafe. It's, uh, it's actually on Saturdays. It's a Saturday cafe where people come from all over the state. Now we're getting you know, people even from out of state. And the whole idea is to have a day experience, just to slow down, slow food, and eat everything that we grow on the ranch. You know, and, and, and we have the grass-fed beef and the eggs and, the, and, and all, all the stuff, the stuff, the stuff. Almost every single weekend, I have a young person. I had somebody who was a med student, a med school student, um, a couple of weekends before. I had another guy who's at San Antonio Community College. Almost every weekend, there's somebody who's 21, 22, 23. There is, I think, a subculture of young people. The term is foodie, but, it, but, 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 but I mean, I think it, it's, it's so much deeper than that. You know, um, so there are people who are starting to recognize that food is important and food is an art form and food is a way of celebrating life and food is a way of expressing yourself and food is a way of, of, of manifesting the fact that your body is your temple and what you put in, doggone it, you're going to get out. So now you're responsible for that. So I've been amazed how since we've been doing this cafe, people write me and say, you know, can I come and cook with you? Can I come and cook with you? And they're always young people. 
you know, some of whom who've, de who've developed knife skill skills and, and, and cooking techniques just through watching the Food Channel and experimenting. And always, it's a, it's a community activity. They, they talk of getting together with their friends and being the designated cook instead of the designated driver and so on. So it's just an intentional mindset, but, but I think that there are a lot of people that are adopting that mindset now. And that is what's interesting about this generation of, you know, I was reading a book the other day that really referred to your generation as the millennials, and that the millennials are the ones that now are much more community-minded in, you know, when, hey, let's get together and let's just cook together as a group than, say, just a couple of generations ago would have never even done that. And that the human, there's something about our, um, in, deep inside in our human DNA, we want to, we want that community of sitting together, breaking bread. It's, it's just part of us. I'm sorry, I just need to add one other thing. I, I just want to challenge you also here at Texas Lutheran. This is something I, I started my career in college and universities about nine years ago at Tulane University. And I was there for six years and we had started this program because I always worried about the students about, okay, I'm going to go to res dining and then four years later, it's what's for dinner. So part of that training piece over there was as a group, once a month, we would assemble in a small kitchen that I had downstairs and we would make jambalaya together and etouffee and bread pudding and we would talk about food. I challenge you here at Texas Lutheran because if you go to Res Dining here and you walk in and you ask for Chef Ernest Cervantes, the guy that you have in the kitchen right now has 110 trophies for Texas barbecue. He is the state champion barbecue brisket cooker. And if you want to talk about food and understand passion, sit down with Chef Cervantes for about a, about a minute or so, and he's going to pull you in really quick. And uh, he loves to bring people into the kitchen and talk and cook. And, and so I challenge you, go through the swinging door. Look for the chef. Thank you. With that note, Stephen, if you don't mind, if you would direct your question to whatever individual, but in order for those in the audience who do want to get an autograph book from Chef Besh and mindful of the time schedule that we all have, I'm going to ask that all of us, with a warm uh, round of applause, to thank our panelists.